the China Connect, the financial market, the trade war, the geopolitical relationship. And now we're going to switch gears to look at more micro picture in our third session today, where we're going to look at how firms in China responded to different um, shocks, different policies. And we are pleased to have two speakers. I forgot to introduce myself. But uh, let me introduce the speakers first. Uh, we are pleased to have two speakers, uh, Jie Bai from Harvard Kennedy School and uh, Jing Cai from uh, University of Maryland. And my name is Maggie Chen. I'm from GW. So welcome again. And uh, let's welcome uh, Jie to the podium. Thank you. Thanks for the organizers for having me. Um, I should say first that this title is a little bit outdated. It has nothing to do with the impeachment. This is a quid pro quo in the context of uh, trading technology for market access in the Chinese automobile industry. So uh, actually when we first, and this is joint work with uh, three other Chinese scholars, when we first started working on this project uh, two years ago, China and the USA were still at peace. There was no trade wall. So we were basically after a long-standing question in economics, which is, does the presence of foreign firms actually facilitate knowledge diffusion to the developing countries, and what are the underlying mechanisms? So we thought that we have some cool, exciting data that I will tell you in a moment to answer this question. However, as you know, during the process that we were putting together the data, the trade wall broke out. As we heard from the previous speakers, basically this issue became the front line of the trade debate. So I'm very excited to share with you what we've learned and uh, hear everyone's feedback. Okay, so quid pro quo in the context of technology for market policy. This is a common industrial policy in developing countries, typically requiring multinational firms to transfer technological know-how in exchange for market access, typically through the form of joint ventures. So the key feature of uh, this class of policy is the requirement on joint own ownership requirement. And there's usually a strict ownership restriction cap on the foreign capital. So now from the domestic country's perspective or the recipient country's perspective, this policy aims to bring in technology advanced know-hows from the developed countries to the developing countries and to facilitate domestic learning and you know, catch up. Um, However, I think a big open empirical and policy question is whether this policy is actually effective in facilitating knowledge diffusion. Okay, so we are going to study this question in the context of the Chinese auto industry during 2009 to 2015. So we put together a unique data set with detailed quality measures along multiple dimensions of vehicle performance, essentially for the universe of all, of all car models sold in the country during this period. And we combine that rich quality data with the entire joint venture network, as well as detailed plant location for each of the models, car models produced, and also information on the parts and components suppliers at the model level, and also across plant, plant to plant worker flow information. So we try to basically, all together, this will allow us to first examine the patterns of knowledge spillover, and also try to understand the role played by ownership affiliation, geography, production network, and labor mobility. Okay, so here is a picture that shows a giant auto assembly plant in northern China owned by GM Shanghai. So basically, in order to produce and sell cars in China, um, foreign automakers have to form a joint venture with one of the domestic firms. And now from the Chinese government's perspective, this policy basically tries to incentivize foreign firms to bring in technology and allow the domestic firms to learn and catch up. Now, however, if that really happens, from American business perspective, this is basically they're, they're just training their future rivals. Okay, and if you actually read the 301 complaint filed by the US trade representative, this issue at the core, as we heard from Chad mm -hmm. earlier today, this issue is basically at the core of the trade debate. In fact, technology transfer under the strict ownership restriction is a key component. Uh, it's considered to be a key com component of China's um, unfair FDI regime. It's also the stated justification behind Trump's administration's uh, you know, uh, decision to impose 50 billion tariffs, on, uh, tariffs on, on Chinese imports in early 2008. So there have been a lot of legal debates 
around this issue, you know, what is, what is forced, what is not forced. Um, so what we are hoping that is that we can bring some economic insights into the table and to, to basically complement what we've learned uh, from international scholars and legal scholars. So the key economic question is really to understand the role of ownership affiliation in mediating knowledge diffusion. You know, is it effective um, in facilitating learning and knowledge spillover? And more importantly, what are the underlying mechanisms? In particular, how does ownership affiliation interact or compare with other traditional channels of knowledge <laughs> spillover, such as uh, through geography, through production network, through worker flows. And understanding these mechanisms will also crucially help us to think about the policy implications. There is actually, uh, this actually speaks to a very timely policy question, basically in light of the trade tensions between China and the US, <coughs> the Chinese government has pledged to remove the ownership restriction by 2022, starting to allow wholly owned foreign firms in three years. So there have been, you know, many people have speculated this could have profound implications, not just on the Chinese industry, but also global auto industry. So I think um, you know, understanding the role played by the ownership affiliation is a first step to think about the implication of removing such. Okay. Um, so let me start by telling you a bit about the setting. So quid pro quo is a long-standing industrial policy uh, in the auto industry since 90, uh, 1980s. At the, beginning, um, at the beginning of the open door policy, um, li literally most of the uh, vehicle production in China was concentrated in heavy trucks and buses, and there was virtually no private vehicle ownership. Uh, somewhat interestingly, the concept of joint venture was actually first proposed by the GM CEO Thomas Murphy in one of his visits to China, and that idea was quickly reported to the pragmatic leader Deng Xiaoping at that time, and since then became the long-standing policy. So in a typical joint venture requirement, the foreign automaker offer existing product lines, existing models that they were producing and selling in other markets um, as a know-how, as equity. So the Chinese partner is going to provide the manufacturing facility and labor. Okay? And there's a strict ownership restriction on the foreign capital capped at 50%. Now the policy rationales are twofold. Uh, the first is the, you know, the standard infant industry argument, but more importantly, this policy aims to facilitate learning uh, you know, of the domestic firm, uh, allow them to learn and catch up over time. Now, in the early period, before 2000, most of the manufacturing activity in the auto industry was, um, was, you know, what took the form of uh, what we call knockdown kit assembly. So essentially, the big, you know, the foreign automakers, they will ship big parts and components to China and simply do the final assembly stage inside those joint venture plants. Therefore, technology, you know, knowledge transfer was very limited in the early period. Also, at the same time, there were very few indigenous brands. In fact, a lot of the domestic firms gave up on their own brands as a result of the success of the joint ventures. Um, but things started to change after 2000. So, uh, as we heard from Daniel earlier this morning, there were a lot of industrial policies uh, that basically, and fiscal policies that tries to encourage indigenous innovation and independent brands. And under these government policies, a lot of these domestic firms started to launch their first indigenous models after 2005. At the same time, the industry experienced a dramatic growth after the entry into WTO. Basically, sales of new passenger vehicles increased from less than 1 million units in 2001 to 25 million in 2017, becoming the largest auto market in the world. Uh, in 2017, China alone accounts for about one third of the global auto production and sales. And there, there we also saw greater entry of international joint ventures. <coughs> so by the end of 2015, there are 26 big international joint ventures operating in the Chinese market with a pretty complicated ownership network. Uh, sorry, the title is a bit cut off. So this picture basically shows a snapshot of the joint venture network. <laughs> so here the blue boxes are the foreign automakers. The orange boxes, these are the affiliated domestic firms. And each black line basically represents one joint venture affiliation. And 
at the same time, you have a lot of independent domestic, Chinese domestic automakers. Most of these firms are private companies. And in fact, all of these orange boxes, the affiliated domestic firms are big state-owned enterprises. So basically the policy right from the beginning favored uh, these large SOEs. Okay, and two patterns to, to note here. First of all, one foreign partner, one foreign company can have multiple domestic partners. So for example, Volkswagen has one joint venture with Shanghai and another joint venture with First Auto Works. At the same time, one domestic partner could have multiple uh, foreign partners. And we can, you know, basically, we can group uh, these joint ventures into seven big SOE groups headed, you know, centered around these affiliated domestic firms. So in this context, how should we think about leader and follower in terms of thinking about learning and knowledge diffusion? So here is a stylized uh, illustration. So here, this is the plant, this is a joint venture plant owned by BMW Brilliance, okay? Inside the joint venture plant, the firm produces uh, existing models of BMW. At the same time, Brilliance Auto has its own independent domestic plants. And these are completely separate firm entities. So we, we should not be thinking about side-by-side -side production lines. These are happening, these models, the domestic models on the top are produced in completely separate manufacturing facilities owned by Brilliance Auto, okay? Um, but we can, you know, even though the production lines are not side-by-side, -side, there could be other channels of knowledge diffusion, which we're gonna explore in the empirical analysis. Um, to think about leader-follower pairs in terms of learning and knowledge diffusion, we can start from the most broad definition. Essentially, all of the models, domestic models, indigenous brands uh, of Brilliance Auto could benefit, could learn from the joint venture, affiliated joint ventures models. Or learning may be more you know, segment specific. My sedan models benefit more from the sedan models of BMW. And same thing for SUV. So essentially in the uh, empirical analysis, we're going to start with the most broad definition and let the data telling us uh, what is the scope of learning and also that should shed light on the underlying mechanisms. Okay. So this picture, so let me uh, just give you the intuition behind the key empirical identification strategy here. So let's imagine, essentially we're looking for leader follower patterns in terms of relative quality strengths. The idea is very similar to comparative advantage that we talk about in trade. Um, the, this essentially really tries to leverage the rich quality data that we have at the product level across multiple quality dimensions. So here is one uh, stylized illustration. So there are two joint venture models, two leader models, one produced by uh, BMW 3 Series and Nissan Sunny. Okay? Uh, one consistent pattern that we see in our data, which is not, probably not very surprising to people here, is that German models tend to have a stronger relative strength in engine and safety features. And Japanese models tend to be relatively stronger in fuel efficiency, as we uh, see here. So the key question is whether the domestic models affiliated with these leader firms actually pick up the same qual relative quality strengths, which we take as evidence of learning and knowledge diffusion. Okay. okay. Now let me tell you the, um, the, give you a brief overview of the data, and uh, the, especially in particular the quality data that we have. The quality data is um, c collected from JD Power. So it's considered to be one of the most trusted and influential quality studies in the industry. So we are very fortunate. We actually got the micro data from JD Power, which has hundreds of quality ratings across multiple dimensions for nearly all of the models sold in this country, in the country during this period. And uh, we map all of the models to particular exact plant locations where these models get produced and also collect supplier information for the key parts and components for each of the models, as well as um, worker flows uh, from Chinese uh, LinkedIn data um, that give us the entire work history of the uh, workers who have worked in the auto industry. Okay, now let's, let me begin with the quality data. The quality data is collected by JD Power through extensive large-scale nationwide surveys every year. So they survey consumers, new car buyers, 
um, from over 50 cities in China. And there are two separate quality studies, IQS and appeal. So IQS is really measuring the number of malfunctions, number of defects um, that the owner encountered during the first three months of the ownership. So there are questions like in the engine category, for example, there are quest problems like the engine doesn't start at all, um, driving experience, the emergency parking brake uh, won't hold the vehicle. So questions like this is really capturing the uh, malfunctionalities of the vehicle. And the appeal power as opposed to IQS is more subjective. It captures user uh, satisfaction or emotional attachment with the vehicle. So for example, in the engine category, um, they will ask the respondents to rank the smoothness of gear shift operation from one to 100. So in total, there are more than 200 functionalities under IQS and more than 100 dimensions under appeal for each model. And JD Power then aggregate all these questions into uh, subcategories. So there are nine quality dimensions under IQS and 10 dimensions under appeal. Mm -hmm. So um, we can, you know, we can we basically, our identification is going to explore the relative strengths um, across these dimensions within product and looking for leader follower patterns. Okay. So let me, whoops, now you have to trust me on the, on the pattern. So basically, uh, this figure tries to show you the quali overall quality improvement uh, during this period. Let's focus on the right uh, that graph uh, for now. If we see the same patterns uh, along multiple dimensions of quality. Basically, the blue line represents the joint ventures benchmark. Okay, so here we multiply a negative one in front of the IQS measure, so a larger number represents fewer defects. So the, the larger, the better. So the blue line is the joint venture benchmark, and the orange line, these are the models produced by the affiliated SOEs. And the purple line, these are the models produced by non-affiliated you know, private firms. And across the board from 2009 to 2015, we see a remarkable pattern of quality catch up and convergence. Now apparently, a lot of things could be going on that drives this pattern. So for example, rising domestic income, as consumers become richer, they demand higher and higher quality cars, and also rising competition, which creates incentive for everyone to innovate and upgrade. So the empirical challenge is really try to um, control for all these confounding uh, demand side and supply side factors and try to isolate the role played by ownership affiliation in terms of facilitating learning and knowledge diffusion. I've already given you the key intuition. Essentially, we're looking for um, leader follower patterns in relative quality strengths across these multiple vehicle dimension, performance dimensions. Um, let me skip them keep the math and just show you the results. So basically we start with the broadest definition, right? So what is the association in relative quality strengths between any random pair of joint venture models and domestic models? That is uh, this coefficient. And having two, mo two models being the same affiliated group will increase that association by 0 0.03. And if we further zoom in whether these two models are in the same vehicle segment, meaning sedan SUV, and also in the same joint venture group, that number um, becomes much larger. So essentially this is telling us that most of the learning and diffusion seems to be you know, uh, concentrated among models produced by the same affiliated partners and in the same uh, segment. To interpret that number, essentially uh, if we map this into the IQS in, in terms of thinking about the number of defects, this number implies that a reduction of 10 defects in a joint venture model will lead to a reduction of two defects among all of the domestic followers in the same segment, in the same joint venture group. Okay. Uh, so economists were obsessed with uh, alternative explanations and robustness checks. I'm going to uh, skip, skip most of this, but just uh, say that um, we've thought very hard about identification. Our results are uh, we can rule out a bunch of uh, uh, as, um, alternative stories such as endogenous joint venture network formation based on relative strengths or overlapping customer base, or you know, how much of this is externality spillover, how much of that's driven by direct technology transfer. 
For this, we use the patent application, patent transfer data, to show you that these patterns are not driven by explicit market transactions as a result of you know, patent licensing, patent transfer. So now let me get to the mechanism. So the first question that we ask is actually, you know, how much of this diffusion pattern that we see is actually driven by geography instead of ownership affiliation? Because these domestic models and joint venture models they do tend to locate in the same city. So here this, uh, here's a map that maps all of the vehicle production plants in China. Each circle is a city. The colors of the circle represents the ownership composition of the vehicle plants in that city. So we can see some cities host you know, joint venture plants, domestic plants, and also a, uh, independent domestic plants, and also affiliated SOEs plants. And there's a partial overlap between ownership affiliation and geography. So for example, this is one of the largest uh, SOEs. So it has, a joint, it has a plant in a city which also holds uh, its joint ventures plant. But at the same time, it has a plant in a city which doesn't host its joint venture plant. Sim similarly, this is a plant uh, owned by one of the private stars without any ownership affiliation, but nonetheless, the, the, the firm can have a plant that co-locates here in Shanghai, co-locates in a city that, that hosts a joint venture plant. So then exploring this partial network, we can decompose the impact of ownership by ownership and geography. So the key takeaway from this table is that um, spillover seems to be the strongest among models in the same joint venture group in the, in the same city. However, even for those models not in the same group, as long as they're produced in the same city, we see a, a very strong um, association in terms of relative strengths. Okay, this is suggesting that ownership affiliation helps to facilitate learning, but it's not, the, uh, it's not a necessary requirement for knowledge spillover. Um, so let me summarize the key takeaways um, as we look into the potential channels. So we look at two things. One is how much of this you know, uh, learning is, can be explained by overlapping in production network, and how much of that can be explained by worker flows across firms. Starting from supplier network, so here uh, we collect the data from mark lines. This is far from being a sensor of the Chinese production you know, supplier network for the industry, but I think it's, it's safe to say that this data captures the main part suppliers for each model, uh, and for the main parts, main vehicle parts. So um, we establish two things from this data. The first is that we see that affiliated firms or firms that locate in the same city do tend to share more common suppliers. Okay? And, and indeed, higher overlap in supplier network does lead to higher similarity, greater similarity in relative quality strengths. And um, the number so we did, if you do a back of the envelope calculation, it actually suggests that 31% of the knowledge diffusion across ownership affiliation can be explained by overlapping in supplier network. And 40% of the uh, spillover in geography can be explained by supplier overlap. And um, this part is still work in progress, so we also plan to look at how much of the relative strength similarity can be explained by labor mobility. So here, um, the data is from LinkedIn. Uh, there are in total more than 50,000 uh, LinkedIn users who have ever worked in the auto industry. Uh, so far, we've cleaned 10,000 profiles, and so the, the basically each profile contains their entire uh, past employment history. Um, and uh, among the 10,000 profiles, 16% of the workers have ever moved jobs. Okay. And if we look, at, we look at the turnover patterns among these workers, we see some interesting patterns. So let's focus on panel A. Whoops. <laughs> panel A first. This shows uh, the job transition rate across ownership types uh, for all workers. So one, thing, uh, one, one, one pattern to note is that there's actually a high probability of moving across ownership types. Come, you know, starting from a JV, 40% moved to another JV, 35% moved to an independent domestic automaker, and 24% moved to one of the uh, big <coughs> affiliated uh, SOEs. Uh, 
And among that 24%, one third of them actually moved to the affiliated SOE of the particular joint venture. So this is, that's, that's pretty high um, in that category. So um, this could explain why we see uh, greater similarity in terms, of, uh, uh, in terms of ownership network. And if we look at the skilled workers, uh, one interesting pattern that we see is that no matter where they are from, they're more likely to move to one of the independent plants. Um, this can be explained, as this is actually consistent anecdotally with the pretty aggressive recruiting effort that these firms are undertaking in order to attract talents. In terms of the geography pattern of these movers, many of them, 60% uh, of the, all the movers stayed in the same city, which can explain why we see stronger association in, uh, in learning and diffusion for models produced in the same city. So it's still work in progress. Essentially, we hope to construct plant-to-plant -plant worker flows and try to um, do, um, do the similar exercise as we did for the supplier network. Um, let, me, let me skip this. Um, um, it, people may ask, and I will respond to that. So here, in the last part of the paper, we calibrate a simple learning and diffusion model to try to think about the policy question. So here, this is the same graph, basically showing the empirical observed patterns of, not, uh, of quality catch up. So um, one policy counterfactual is that what would have happened if China removed quid pro quo in 2009 at the beginning of the period? This is very partial equilibrium in the sense that we are holding the market structure fixed. Essentially, we are using the reduced form estimates to calibrate the knowledge diffusion strengths uh, with and without ownership affiliation. So if we remove ownership affiliation uh, in 2009, that will reduce the average quality of the domestic models by 12%. So that's equivalent to 16 fewer reductions of defects or malfunctionality. However, the impact of shutting down, further removing geography spillovers is much more pronounced. So that's a gap represented by the dashed line and the dotted line. So that will further reduce quality by 30%. So taken together, I think there are three main takeaways from the study. The first is that we do see evidence of knowledge spillovers by both ownership and geography. Um, however, even though ownership affiliation facilitates learning, it's not the primary driver of quality upgrading during this period. And there are these broad-based market mechanisms, such as production network and labor mobility, which explained, which played an important role in, in driving domestic quality upgrade. <coughs> Mm, so back to the policy motivation. So in light of the, I think our findings suggest that if, um, removing the quid pro quo will not significantly hinder domestic upgrading. But at the same time, it could create stronger incentive uh, for foreign firms to introduce better models, better technology into the Chinese market in the first place. Because first of all, you capture larger share of the profits and also you can better, probably better guard the know-hows. Uh, and domestic firms, on the other hand, the affiliated <laughs> firms would have stronger pressure to innovate and upgrade. So I will end with um, one important question that I think uh, requires more future research, which is essentially in light of these global knowledge diffusion patterns, how should we think about the foreign firms' incentive? Here we're thinking about GM in the US. How should we think about the foreign firms' incentive to innovate in the first place in light of the global uh, knowledge diffusion? And people have shown that there are indeed important, interesting strategic incentive, incentives here to think about. Thank you. Okay, uh, thanks for inviting me. And today I'm going to talk about direct and indirect effects of financial access on SMEs. And this is a joint work with Adam Sido at the Central European University. So we know that lack of right credit is widely believed to be a major growth barrier. But we know very little about the overall impact of credit on firms, accounting for both the direct effect of borrowing and the indirect effect from the uh, peer firms who might also be borrowing, especially for SMEs. So specifically, while there's a growing number of papers looking at the impact of finance on business growth, most of those papers focus on either very big firms or very small family business. Starting the, uh, the impact on SMEs is important because they employ a majority of labor force in developing countries, 
and they can be severely financial constrained because their credit demand is normally too big for microfinance and they normally lack the collateral for formal funding. More importantly, few studies look at indirect effects on peer firms of any firm level intervention, while understanding such effects can be key to measuring broader impacts on society. So the, the goal of this paper is to estimate both direct and indirect effects of improved access to credit on SMEs. And to do this, we work with a big bank in China in which we randomized access to a new loan product for SMEs both within and across local markets in China. So in this way, we created a variation not only in the probability of an individual firm to borrow, but also in the likelihood and uh, share of the, their peer firms uh, borrowing. So based on this design, we seek to answer two questions. First, what are the direct and indirect effects of um, credit on firm growth? And second, what are the implied welfare effects? So to uh, evaluate the welfare gain, we combine our estimates with a um, uh, model of industry equilibrium. So this paper builds on and contributes to two main literature. First, the paper builds on the literature about impact of finance. And what we added to this literature is by estimating the indirect effects of credit on firm growth. And second, there are some recent papers looking at the indirect and equilibrium effects of various type of firm level intervention. So there's very little work on this with the following uh, a few exceptions. So Bloom, Shankerman, and Marinen 2013 paper studies the spillover and the business dealing effect of R&D in the US. Rotenberg 2017 looks at the indirect effect of government subsidy policies on mid-sized firms in India. <coughs> and McKenzie and Puto 2018 studies the effect, uh, both direct and indirect effects of business training programs uh, for microenterprises in Kenya. And our contribution is to provide experimental evidence of, of about credits direct and indirect effects on SMEs, and we also provide a model-based wafer accounting. So firstly, let me introduce the, our experimental design and data. So in the year 2013, the Rural Credit Cooperatives, RCC, which is one of the major banks in China, introduced a new loan product to SMEs in Jiangxi province of China, located in uh, southeastern China. So the program was targeted to clusters of firms in specialized local markets. So those are local clusters of firms specialized in some particular product category. So for example, they are like a furniture market where most firms uh, uh, they are sell furniture, and there's also markets for clothes, shoes, building materials, etc. And the fact that the program is offered on the market level is the key innovation. And there are several benefits of doing so. So for example, each market actually has a market office and a manager who can provide a lot of information about local firms to the bank officers. And this can greatly save the uh, screening and the monitoring cost. It can also save the travel cost of bank officers because by coming to one market, they can visit multiple clients at the same time. And because of those cost reductions, uh, the bank does not require any collateral for, the, uh, for this product. And they also standardize the uh, loan application process and they make sure that they make a decision in two weeks. So once the firm decided to borrow, they can receive a maximum <coughs> amount of loan of 500,000 RMB. So this is about uh, 17,000 US dollars with a monthly interest rate of about 0.7%. And the firms pay interest every month and repay the principal in two years. So our main treatment is to have the loan officer visit treated um, firms monthly for a year. And during the visit, they would provide information about benefits of the loan and also help them to fill out all the application forms if they decided to borrow. And we randomized this treatment to firms in uh, uh, 78 markets. And in uh, 31 pure control markets, we treated no firms. In 10 half and half markets, we treated half of the firms. While in seven, uh, 37 majority treated markets, we treated 80% of, uh, of those firms. Then we surveyed half of the firms in all markets with a total sample of about um, uh, 3,100 firms 
we did three rounds of surveys, a baseline uh, in summer 2013 before we start the intervention, a midline in 2015, uh, 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 we skipped 2014 in order to give time for firms to uh, borrow and grow, and lastly, an uh, end line in uh, summer 2016. And in those surveys, we collected data on uh, managerial characteristics, uh, balance sheet information, borrowing from both for formal and informal sources, and for, uh, firm operation. So this is a photo mm -hmm. of uh, um, one of the markets in our sample, and this is a uh, building materials market. So first, let's look at some summary statistics. Uh, so the data shows that our sample firms are about, uh, on average, 60 to 7 years old. A majority of the sample firms are uh, retail companies. With um, uh, so 70 percent, almost 70 percent of them are retail companies, with another like 25 percent in the survey sector. The average number of employment is about nine, and the average sales is about 300,000 um, RMB. And only 25 percent of our sample firms have borrowed from um, a formal bank in the year uh, before our baseline survey, and most of them told us that it's still difficult for them to get formal funding. Uh, because of lack of collateral or like requirement of government guarantees from the bank. And from baseline to uh, end line, we have a 14% uh, attrition. And all those uh, characteristics are balanced uh, between the trading and control companies. So firstly, let's look at uh, what's the impact of the treatment on loan outcomes. So here we provide a, a cross-sectional regression using only the end line data where the outcome is a dummy variable equaling to one if the firm received the loan uh, from this uh, new, new uh, credit program. So column one shows that treated companies are about 32 percentage points more likely to receive the loan, suggesting a, a large treatment effect. Then in column two, we break it down by uh, market type and firm type. So first, if you look at the constant, uh, it shows that uh, firms in pure control firms, where like uh, markets where no firms got treated, um, they only have like 3.4% uh, likelihood to receive this uh, product. <coughs> then if you look at the interaction between untreated and uh, market type, it shows that control firms in treated markets are about 14 percentage points more likely than pure control firms to receive this credit. So this, this suggests that there are some like information diffusion in uh, uh, treated markets where control firms might have learned the opportunity of this, uh, uh, of this product from treated firms in the same market. Um, so before I show you the regression results, let's first look at some like big picture data pattern. Um, so in this figure, we plot the uh, density of lock sales uh, at the baseline for three groups of firms. The treated companies, uh, control companies in treated uh, markets, and firms in pure control markets. So the, in the baseline, the distribution looks very similar, which validates our randomization. And then um, three years later, we see that the blue line, which represents the treated companies, moved to the right. And this suggests a positive uh, direct effect, while the red line, which indicates the control firms in treated markets, moved to the left of the green curve, which is the, the pure control firms. So this suggests a, a negative, indi uh, negative indirect effect. But please note that the indirect effect can be either positive or negative. So it can be positive because of the information diffusion effect, as I showed you earlier. It can be also negative because of some like business dealing um, effect. Okay. So to add, uh, we, we also provide uh, uh, the radical framework in order to guide the uh, empirical estimation and the welfare calculation. Um, but I'll skip that because of time constraint. And then to estimate the impact of our um, treatment on uh, firm outcomes, here is the specification uh, we use. So the outcome can be like um, uh, sales, profit, or employment. Then on the right-hand side, cost is an indicator for the midline or end line survey. Treatment is the, uh, a dummy variable if a firm received uh, uh, the, the, um, the, uh, the treatment. And we also include firm fixed effects and we cluster an error on the market level. So there are two coefficients of interest. The first one is beta, 
which represents the direct effect of the treatment, and the second one is the delta, which represents the indirect effects of, um, of competitors' treatment. So this table uh, shows the impact on uh, main outcomes. So looking at column one on, uh, on Luxelt, for example, so it shows that where uh, from baseline to end line survey, control firms uh, got a sales growth of about 3.7%. If you received the treatment, there's an additional 10% growth in sales. However, there's also a very big negative in, uh, indirect effect showing that if you have all competitors treated, then it can lower the sales growth by about 8.8%. Uh, and we see similar uh, pattern of impacts on uh, profits, employment, and uh, on materials. Okay. Um, so in order to validate the estimation, here we also do a classical test in which we estimate the direct and indirect effects using only the baseline data, but we, only, uh, we don't see any effect there, and this confirms both the within and cross-market randomization. Next, we look at whether the, the impact is different between treated and control companies. So here we decompose the interaction of post and share of competitors treated uh, to treated and control firms uh, separately. So we see that even for treated firms, there's also a negative indirect effect, but the magnitude is much smaller than the negative impacts on, uh, on, on uh, control firms. However, we don't have enough power to estimate uh, all those three effects. Okay, so then let's look at some uh, the impact on some intermediate outcomes which might have contributed to the, um, to the effect pattern. So firstly, we look at the impact on business outcomes. So the table here shows that while there's no impact on suppliers, there's a big effect on the number of clients where we see that treated firms experienced uh, 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 a much bigger uh, growth in the number of clients, but again, there is a big negative indirect effect. So this suggests that there are some like within market reallocation uh, of clients. And to understand why that's the case, in columns three to five, we look at the effect of the treatment on renovation, introductory of new products, and advertisement cost. And we see that treated companies are also more likely to renovate their store, introduce new products, and increase their advertisement cost. Uh, cost. So this suggests that treated firms seem to attract clients from control firms by offering better services uh, to, to clients. And there's no evidence of impact on uh, markup or, uh, or on rent. So uh, next, we also look at the impact on some financial outcomes. And the only thing I want to highlight here is that there's no crowding out effect of existing loans because we see that there's no negative impact on borrowing from other sources. So this suggests that those firms are uh, credit constrained. And lastly, we run a market level uh, regression. Um, from columns one and two, we see that there's no significant impact on the market level sales and profit. So this is consistent with our finding before that the direct effect and indirect effect almost canceled out. However, we do see that there are some market wide gains in survival, renovation, and um, product introduction. So lastly, um, we do some like welfare calculation. And for this, we bring back this positive um, information diffusion indirect effects, and we estimate the direct effect and the two types of indirect effect in the same framework. So to do this, we run this, um, uh, the following uh, instrument variable regression in which we regress outcomes on uh, BI, which is uh, whether uh, an individual firm is borrowing, and ZI, which is the share of competitors that borrow. And we instrument uh, firms borrowing by the treatment, and we instrument the share of competitors that borrow by the share of competitors got, uh, got treated. So the IV results are consistent uh, with the uh, uh, estimation results we showed before, which shows a big uh, direct effect and uh, also a big negative uh, indirect effect. So then, suppose that treat, uh, treating a share S of a market 
can use a random share of ZT from stock traded borrowing and the U untreated um, borrowers. Then the welfare gain from treating the share as the firms can be written in the following way. So there are basically three components here. The first the term is the producer surplus, which equals the sum of direct and indirect profit effects. The second term is consumer surplus, which is calculated by the reduction in cost of purchasing the current bundle. And the last term is a spillover effect, which represents the additional producer and consumer uh, surplus from diffusion. So it, for a given sigma, we can uh, compute all terms from our estimation. And we consider two values of sigma in the calculation. First one is six, which is close to our revenue to profit uh, ratio. And the other is more uh, conservative um, value of 11. And we consider two scenarios. First one is to treat all firms mm -hmm. in the market. And second one is to treat 50% firms in the, in the market. So looking at panel B, which we assume that sigma equals 11, we see that if we treat all firms in the market, then it can generate a producer surplus of 1.2%, and the dollar amount is about 900. So this is small because um, the direct, if the positive direct effect and negative indirect effect almost got canceled out. However, we do see a sizable uh, consumer surplus of 9.9%. .9 uh, percent with a dollar amount of 7,400. Uh, and there's also a positive um, gain from spillover of 11.1%. Okay. So basically this shows that there's a big, while there's um, almost zero producer uh, surplus, there's large gains in consumer surplus, even with a conservative value um, of sigma. So lastly, we also estimate the uh, return to capital, and we calculate the private return and the social return separately. So the private return is calculated by the profit effect normalized by the size of loan, while in the calculation of social return, we also added back the business dealing and the consumer uh, surplus. So our estimates of the uh, private return is about 82. So this is in between of the current estimation of uh, Benadryl Duflo 2014, which estimated of 105%, uh, um, and the more actual 2008 estimate of uh, 60%. So the social return is about 114% uh, uh, with a sigma uh, of, of 6. So it's, um, it's kind of different from the private return, but still very large. So to conclude, in this paper, we examine the impact of financial access on SMEs. So we find a big positive direct effect, but also a large and negative business dealing effect and a positive diffusion effect. And a, a model-based account of big uh, direct and indirect effects on firms and the consumers imply a sizable uh, way of fair. Thank you for two very interesting presentations. Let's now open up to questions. Yes. So this is Yao Pan from IEP. Uh, I have a question for Jing. Is that um, so? What is the loan maturity? Like, what's the loan length? Um, and also. Um, are there any sustainable impact, or it's just you have a positive effect during the long period, but afterwards you kind of going back? And second question is that um, do you observe? Do you have information on the default rate of the loans? Suppose you are treating the whole market. Then suppose you are treating a fraction of the market. Then basically you are putting half of the or a small fraction of the firms having advantage over other firms. Um, so they probably will be profitable, and then they're more likely to pay back the loans. But if you treat 80% of the market, then maybe you know the competition just increases, and then you will increase the default rate and also the cost of the intervention. Thank you. Let's collect a couple more questions. If yes, Chang. 
I have a question for Jay. So I'm actually thinking about a possible example if a foreign auto producer has two affiliates. One targets high-end consumers and uh, the other, you know, target lower-end consumers. Do we see those two type of vehicles share similar strength even when they are targeting different markets? And also, in, so in this case, if there are any learning, you know, what type of learning is there? All right, maybe we can answer this question first while, you know, more questions come up. Sure. Um, so uh, the, the duration of the, of the law is about two years, and we hope to measure, like, much longer term effects uh, by collecting uh, more follow-up surveys. But here, uh, the end line survey actually was like three years after borrowing, and there's still like a big positive direct effect. And the default rate is, uh, is very low. So the repayment rate is about 99% or something like that. Yeah, thanks for the for the question. So it's um, so first of all, um, even if a joint uh, foreign firm has multiple different joint ventures, for they produce different. They choose to produce different models with different domestic partner. It's never the case that the same model will be, will be produced by by two different domestic partners. And another thing to note is that. Um, in terms of the quality gap, you know, the high end versus low end, in general, the domestic models, indigenous brands, are half the price of the joint venture brands. So they are really not targeting the same consumer segment yet. So in just in terms, just look at the, the price differentials. And we did look at, you know, uh, do, you tr do you learn more from the better models produced by the joint venture? Or do you learn equally from all of the models produced by the joint venture? So what we find is that we don't find differential learnings uh, along, that, along the joint venture's quality dimension. I think one reason is because the Chinese models are still quite far behind the joint venture models. Even the lower end joint venture models are still ahead of the, ahead of the followers models. So we don't find heterogeneous learning based on the leaders' models uh, quality. Yeah. All right, yes, there's a question on the back. Thank you. I have a question for the first paper. Uh, have you thought, in terms of econometric identification, how to disentangle uh, joint venture knowledge spillovers from like purely economic espionage, or whether that's an issue for your study? Thanks for that. That's a great question. That's a very hard question to answer. So, you know, if we suppose you only see this kind of uh, diffusion patterns as defining our identification, that can be driven by at least several different stories. The first story is this is some genuine externality, knowledge spillover through these market based forces. The second story is what along these lines, you know, is this is how much of this is driven by stealing, explicit or implicit. And the third explanation, which is again very different, is this could be driven by unobserved market transactions, such as patent transfers. You know, there's a payment associated with that. So we're trying our best to try to disentangle these mechanisms. Um, so first, we rule out this is not driven by explicit market transactions. And in terms of the you know, implicit caution, implicit pressure, or uh, so first of all, we haven't heard of any case of outright stealing. In the, in the Chinese auto industry because that is just too blatant. If you use the GM engine on your own car, it's very hard to win the case even in the Chinese courts. So there's no you know, cases of outright stealing. But you're right, there could be this implicit caution going on and which can take many forms, which is very hard to systematically document. So what we show is that these market-based forces that we can observe, production network, labor mobility, if they explain a big part of the diffusion patterns, you know, the residuals could be due to these other channels. All right. Yes. Have you, uh, this is for um, Professor Bay. Have you uh, looked at other industries, or are you contemplating looking at other industries where you might have a different uh, uh, 
correlations or different variables to look consider? Yeah, so um, I think so the quid pro quo is um, it's, it's actually applied to a wide range of uh, strategic industries in China, including the automobile, aircraft. There, there are several big industries. What about steel, for example? I would think that that would be a more ex uh, an area where you would have more opportunities for theft because it's hidden. It's in a factory. The doors are closed. You don't know what, what they've got in there. Yeah, so I think uh, one thing you know is to think about what is the technological technological component uh, in the production process. I think auto is the is in the, the whole assembling process of auto automobile requires a lot of technological know-how. So I think this um, we unfortunately we don't have this rich as such rich data for the other industries, which allows you to tease out other you know confounding. Mm, demand side and supply side forces as we, we have here for the auto industry. But I think the, this could probably generalize to industries that are equally technological intensive and have had this quid pro quo policy in place for, for such a long period of time, where China is still in the catch up phase. Now, this is a traditional combustion engine cars. We're not talking about electric vehicles. You know, that is a totally different story where you're, you can be leaders and followers. So this is the kind of industry where uh, China started from very far behind and for a long time was in the catch-up phase. And the industrial policy was a long-standing policy right from the beginning. Great. If there are no further questions, I guess we'll join, please join me for a round of applause to thank our speakers.